going on everybody how the heck are you guys doing out there we are having a very bad day but that does not matter at all we will continue on and we will help hopefully help you guys um learn a little bit about passover now last week i did a newsletter because this is from brother todd bennett and brother todd bennett has been kicked off youtube for a little bit um because our doctors at youtube have decided that what he was saying what other doctors were saying is incorrect and it's dangerous to your health so we can't have things that are dangerous to your health. Um, keep drinking your Pepsi. Shalom. Today is day seven of month one on the Creator's calendar, also known as April 9th, 2022, on the Roman calendar. Despite what you have heard on various internet sites, Yahuwah did not change his mind and add a date to his calendar last week due to the clouds in Jerusalem. And, you know, guys, I, I'll break in this. I'd never even heard about this, but I know that everybody has a problem with the calendars. There's people that have already celebrated Passover. The Jews on our, on their own uh, crazy calendar. It's very, very, very confusing. So Brother Todd Bennett, before I get going too far into this, is a he's I'm not going to say he's really old, but he's old compared to me. And he has been an attorney for a very long time, a very good attorney. And if you know anything about attorneys, Attorneys have to understand exactly what they're talking about before they will repeat this. And so Todd has written at least 14 books that I know of, big, thick books that probably took a very long time. He is very educated. Um, I've been working with Todd for many, many years now. He's a trusted brother. Um, when I get stuck, I always go to him first, among other folks. But uh, he's one of my first people to do it. And um, I, I believe he's, he's correct on all of this. And he's been to Israel so many times and has seen this go down and has been amongst all the wars of these calendars. So here we are. Just when... Just when I think I've seen it all on the calendar confusion front, something new gets thrown into the mix. Many years ago, I wrote an article titled Calendar Confusion, what dealt with many of the prevailing issues. With every passing year, it seems as though there is always some new event or teaching to, to keep the people of Yahuwah in a state of confusion and disunity. I have mentioned the subjectivity in the past involving those who add barley as a factor in determining a new year in direct violation of Genesis 1-4. Last week, just as 114, excuse me. Last week, I witnessed some Karaites and their followers postpone month one by a day due to clouds. This may seem trivial, but this one decision also altered the date of the Passover as well as the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We have previously discussed the Jewish calendar being the leaven of the Pharisees. And let me break right there because if, if there's anyone new to this channel, you oftentimes, and especially when I was in the Christian religion, I believed that the Pharisees and Sadducees were the people of God. I believed that they were, they were doing what God had told them to do, and they were trying to get people to do what God told them to do. And the son came and told everybody, hey, the, that's old. I'm going to die on the cross. This is all going to be gone. But these Pharisees and Sadducees carry on with this whole bunch of books, extracurriculum stuff that is not inside the Torah that is their own stuff. They call it the oral Torah. It, it contains the Kabbalah, which is a very satanic thing. It, it, and it has horrible, horrible laws that allow you to have sex with a three-year-old girl being a Gentile and things of this nature, right? And, you know, anybody who's read the Torah, that's a thousand percent different than what the Torah says. There's no place in there for that. So here we are. We just witnessed another example of the leaven of the Karaites. Aside from their adding barley into the mix, they now have added clouds. To be very blunt, Yahuwah's calendar operates by the sun and the moon. It does not rely one bit on barley crops. It does not matter whether or not there is a new moon report from Jerusalem. None of these subjective determinations made by men change his calendar. You don't just add days to the month whenever you can't see the moon due to the pollution or clouds. Time and again, I have seen people toying with the calendar based upon their own added beliefs and practices, and it is flat out wrong. We all know that the Pharisees simply created a calculated calendar, separate and apart from the sun and moon. That is clear error. While the Karaites have relied upon observing the first crescent, they have gone astray with their barley inspection teams and their refusal to acknowledge the known reality of the lunar phase when there are clouds obstructing the view of the new moon. For instance, last Shabbat at sunset in Jerusalem, we knew the illuminated fraction of the moon was 2.1409%. The leg time from sunset to moonset was 74.75 minutes. This was definitely a day one moon with plenty of time to be spotted. We have the data and we even knew its precise location in the sky viewed from the former temple location in Jerusalem. 
All of this information is readily available on the Torah calendar website. Interestingly, millions of Muslims were looking for the first crescent moon because it marked the beginning of Ramadan for them. The crescent moon was sighted throughout the Middle East. Regardless, there are some people who reported that the new moon was not seen in Jerusalem because of the cloud cover. That raises an important point. Does the reckoning of time rely on two witnesses other than the sun and the moon as some traditions provide? If that is the case, then time must have stopped after various exiles and revolts when Israelites were expelled from the land. What about before there were no Israelites and there was no temple? Obviously, time continued whether or not people were in the land observing the moon. The same holds true for the situation last weekend. Just because some people did not see the first crescent in Jerusalem does not, does that mean that no one saw it? What if other people saw the renewed moon in Tekoa or Bet Shemesh, but not in Jerusalem, simply because Jerusalem had some haze or clouds? What if these people simply did not report it? Here is what one website stated on the matter. The new moon was not visible in Israel based on reports for 2nd April due to weather. By default, 3 April becomes the start of Aviv. An example of this is in the Mikra would be Noah in the ark counted each month to be 30 days until he could come out of the ark. By default, who says you extend the month by default? That's your tradition. Further, the reference to Noah is an assumption expoliated from Genesis 7, 11 through 24 and Genesis 8, 1 through 4. Those texts do not prove a calendar consisting of 12 months consisting of 30 days, nor do they support a practice of deferring to a 30 day month when there is cloud cover over Jerusalem. I don't think that the ark was floating over Jerusalem during the entire flood. So does this mean whenever we don't get a new moon report from Yisrael, we defer to a 30 day month? No, of course not. In 2016, the fallacy of the Karaite traditions was revealed for anyone to see, at least anyone who was interested. First off, the Karaites subjectively added a 13th month to their calendar because of barley crops. Although there was plenty of barley in the land, if a resheet offering of barley was to be made during the Feast of Unleavened Bread pursuant to Leviticus 23.10, anyone following the Karaites was one month late in their observance of the appointed times. Then, after declaring one month one a late month, then they proceeded to start the month a day late because of the clouds. Interestingly, though, as a result of their subjective determinations, they ended up boxing themselves into a corner the next month. They were forced to celebrate a 28-day month, which is impossible using the sun and moon. You either have a 29-day month or a 30-day month based upon the average of 29.5-day elliptical cycle of the moon. The Karaites delayed delay their month because of clouds when it was clear from the data that the moon would have certainly been a visible new moon. Unlike most teachers who simply sit in front of a webcam and spout their opinions, I was present in Jerusalem to document the situation. I was a witness to the continuing error of their calendar traditions. That is why I regularly try to point people to, away from these two erroneous traditions and toward the two witnesses provided by Yahuwah. The issue was detailed in an article titled The Double Deception of 2016 CE, along with the corresponding data and photographs. For those who recognize the sun and the moon as hands on the clock of the creator, it is fairly easy to discern the day of the month by simply looking at the moon. A clock continues to move whether or not you can see the hands. So those who practice a tradition of visible observation are toying with the clock simply because they cannot see it or they didn't get a report of a sighting. Guess what? Yahuwah saw it and he does not change. Tampering with his calendar in his appointed times is something he does not take lightly. Thousands of people will likely be led astray from the Torah and a proper observance of the appointed times this year because of these people and their reports. A healthy dose of the fear of Yahuwah is in order for those who mess with his times. Admittingly, the calendar is probably one of the most perplexing issues for a new people trying to follow Torah because there is so much confusion. The reason why there is so much confusion is because the appointed times are such an important subject. The calendar is meant to unite. That is why Rome and the Catholic Church imposed the Julian calendar, followed by the Gregorian calendar, upon the Roman Empire. If Constantine had truly converted, he would have adopted the scriptural reckoning of time. Instead, he created the Christian religion and incorporated the solar calendar used by sun worshippers. The Roman Christians purposely separated from the scriptural calendar. For the past 20 years, I have been focusing on the Creator's calendar in order to help people along on their journey. Sadly, I see people jumping from one calendar to another, literally being blown with the winds of doctrines and traditions. Every year, people come to me and ask for clarity and direction, so I view this matter very seriously. While Yahuwah has only one calendar, there is no unified Hebrew calendar, and people pick the calendar that appeals to them. 
So during every cycle of the appointed times, there are people who are observing the Moedin at the correct times and others who will be observing at the wrong time. The question is, what group will you be in this year? Now, I have been counseling people on legal issues for 30 years. Ah, there he is. I, I, I knew it was a while. Counseling people on issues for 30 years and on scriptural issues for over 20. Sometimes those areas overlap. One thing I have learned over the years is that you cannot teach someone who does not want to be taught. You cannot convince someone who has already made up their mind and you cannot change someone who doesn't want to change. And so my, my, I'm going to break real quick here. And so my, my fellow tour keeper friends and, and uh, fear monger and Justin, um, what was that guy's name? Justin, uh, just in case, I think, or I think it's just in case. He's, he's, I think I don't know if he's a new sub or not. But they were talking about. I saw a conversation they had about when they go to Christians, and the Christians just turn them off. They completely turn them off. You explain to them what is in the Bible. You explain about the law, statutes, and commands. You explain about our feast, and they just click it off. It's just over. And it, you will never change their minds. And it, it is it is hard to get people to change their minds. This is why debates are pointless for the debaters. Their goal is to convince others to take their position. It is only those who listen with an open mind that might be impacted by a debate. The calendar is one of those issues that is so filled with opinions and opinions that many people get completely confused and don't know where to turn. And that was our dog saying hello. Is that Leo? That's Leo saying hi. Ultimately, most settle in on one for the sake of unity. But the focus of the appointed times is Yahuwah. They are his, after all, and he sets the date. Leviticus 23, 2. So it becomes a matter of the heart and every person must determine what motivates them. What are they more interested in meeting with Yahuwah or uniting with people? There is no doubt that there could be a sense of comfort in community, but we must be ready and willing to go it alone in the wilderness. If that is where Yahuwah leads us. I have many teachings about the wilderness on my YouTube channel, and there are many lessons to be learned when we step out of our comfort zone and place our trust in him. When we think about the wilderness, it reminds us of the exodus from Egypt that led the Israelites into the wilderness. That journey began with a very significant appointed time known as Passover that occurs on day 14 of month one. In order to properly keep the Passover, we first must know how to tell time. That is why I began the discussion by pointing out the issue of the calendar confusion. Thankfully, the calendar is quite simple and the Torah speaks of the two great lights that act as two witnesses used to determine time and particularly the Moedim, Genesis 1.14. The Torah provides that month one is the month of the Aviv, and the Hebrew word Aviv means green, and the new life springing forth, it refers to the time we call spring. Using the two lights and an examination of history, we understand that the new moon closest to the Tekuva, called the vernal spring equinox, is the beginning of month one, the month of Aviv. But it's not named Aviv, it's only month one. This year, it was easy. The equinox occurred on March 20th, and the new moon was visible after sunset on April 2nd, 2022. It wasn't even a close call. So month one began after sunset on April 2nd, 2022. The Torah calendar website has a lot of resources on the subject, and I encourage you to de examine them, especially the portion on determining the Hebrew year. It is very comprehensive. And again, I will break with this and say, yes, that TorahCalendar.com is extremely complex and if you are ready to get into it you can sit and you can have many days of reading it and try to figure it out but as with todd i believe that torahcalendar.com has it correct on the days and times that we should be keeping these i also strongly encourage people to make sure they are following the calendar that ascribes to the torah and not some other man-made calendar i know that some people follow the jewish calendar in order to be in unity with the jewish people but that is a huge deception the Jewish calendar is a rabbinic fabrication and clearly does not follow the Torah. Also, why would you want to be in unity with a bunch of people who reject the Messiah and don't follow the Torah? It's simply ludicrous. I discussed this issue in my video titled Walking in Darkness for the Sake of Unity. And they not, I'll break again, they not only reject the Torah, but they, and, and the Messiah, well, they reject the Torah because they've added to the Torah a tremendous amount. They, they've added the 25 books called their oral Torah and it kind of trumps the Torah in their minds. But it's also, um, they think our Messiah is boiling in human feces. That is what their Talmud says. It says, Yahushua HaMashiach is boiling in human feces because they've not only rejected him, but they hate him. So, 
continue on. Any determination when month one begins has a direct impact upon the remaining cycle of the appointed times after month one that rely upon bringing harvested offerings to the place where Yahuwah places his name. Once you start the year correctly in month one, you need to know how to count the days in order to properly observe the Passover. The Passover is the entry point to the covenant journey, and every year I am met with questions concerning when to celebrate it. Last week I referred to you re referred you to the article between, titled Between the Evenings Explained. The reason this is so important is because the Pharisees changed the timing of the Pesach from the beginning of day 14 to the end of day 14. They did this by promoting the notion that the term between the evenings, Bain Ha E Baim, involves some concocted time between noon and sunset. That is a rabbinitic creation, and that is not the time when the evening sacrifice was supposed to be offered to Yahuwah. As a result, the Pharisees included the religion of rabbinitic Judaism end up observing the Passover sacrifice at the end of day 14, but all of the remaining ordinances of the Passover, including the meal, flow into day 15. The rabbis have merged the Passover with the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They end up turning the Passover into a feast, which is an enormous mistake, as we shall see. They kill the lamb at the wrong time and then eat it while they are partying. By doing so, they are profaning the entire process and destroying the messianic implications of the observance. They are blotting out the significance of Ha Pesach, the Passover, in the same way that they attempt to blot out Yahushua. No follower of Yahushua should be feasting during the Passover. Instead, we should be doing it in remembrance of him, as he commanded, Luke 22, 19. Yahushua didn't have a feast at his last Passover. It was a somber event where he renewed the broken covenant with Yisrael and revealed that he was the Lamb of Elohim. His body would be broken and his blood would be shed in order to renew the covenant. We recognize what he endured during the night of the Passover and into the Passover day. So, we shouldn't be partying like it's a Jewish holiday. While the Passover is appointed time, it's not a feast. Hag. Instead, the followers of Yahushua should be the ones truly setting the example and being a witness to the world that Yahushua was the Lamb of Elohim. He died for us, and we honor his death by remembering that his suffering, remembering his suffering, we should be doing it right. There is no small thing. Since Yahushua chastised the Pharisees for not being in the kingdom and keeping people out of the kingdom, their traditions kept people away from the Torah then, as they continue to do so to this day. Of course, they reject Yahushua, so why would you expect anything different? If the Israelites in Egypt had decided to observe the Passover meal on day 15 instead of day 14, their firstborn would have been covered by the blood of lamb. It would not have been covered by the blood of the lamb. They would have been dead. They would have been late for the party like the five foolish virgins of Matthew 25. We will look at the future implications further on because timing was a big deal in Egypt and I believe it will be important for those in Babylon expecting a greater exodus as described in Jeremiah and Isaiah. Here's what the Torah says about the Passover. On the 14th day of the first month at twilight is Yahuwah's Passover, Leviticus 23.5. Notice that it is Yahuwah's Passover. He owns it, just like he owns a calendar. As a result, we need to observe it exactly as he prescribes. The emphasis on day 14 is overwhelming throughout the Torah. The scriptures repeatedly and emphatically emphasize the same date for the Passover, day 14, not day 15. It is imperative that you have a solid understanding of a Hebrew day. And I encourage you to view my video titled, Understanding a Hebrew Day. And I'm breaking again and I'm going to put out a little, not, it's not even a sales pitch because Todd really doesn't sell anything. But if you go and check out Shema Yisrael, and check out his website, is Shema Yisrael, his uh, YouTube channel, Shema Yisrael. Of course, he's banned, like I said. But he has tremendous amounts of videos, and they break them down and stuff like this. And so when you guys understand what a Hebrew day is from Todd's perspective and from the Torah's perspective, it's totally different. Uh, and there's where he says, when you understand a Hebrew day, it makes it much easier to comprehend the proper observance of the Passover on day 14. So important is the specific date that there is another admonishment. Let the children of Israel keep the Passover at its appointed time, Numbers 9-2. Again, the appointed time for the Passover is clearly day 14 of month 1, not day 15. Day 15 marked the beginning of a separate seven-day Moad appointed time called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That feast specifically spanned from day 15 to day 21 and commemorated the exodus that occurred after the Passover was completed. See Leviticus 23-6. That is why it is called a feast. It is a celebration of deliverance. The Passover is a somber memorial. It is about death and bloodshed required for redemption. 
Now, the term Passover is HaPesach in Hebrew. As a side note, it has a numeric value of 153. Anybody who knows me has read my books or has been on one of my tours knows the significance of that number in Hebraic thought. Remember the number of large fish Yahushua's disciples caught after his resurrection, John 21, 11? The term sons of Elohim also equals 153 in Hebrew, and the messianic implications are profound, to say the least. So Ha Pesach should be an important focus of anyone who follows Yahushua. But what is the Passover? Is it a day? Is it a feast? Is it an appointed time? Is it a sacrifice? Well, the definition is found in Exodus 12. Speak to all the congregation of Yisrael, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Yisrael shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat it raw, nor boiled it all with water, but roasted in fire, its head with its legs and its entrails. You shall not, you shall let none of it remain until morning. And what remains of it until morning, you shall burn with fire. And thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. So you shall eat it in haste. It is Yahuwah's Passover, Exodus 12, 3 through 11. Again, notice the emphasis that is Yahuwah's Passover. Everything involving this special procedure is Yahuwah's. From the selection to the slaughtering, to the blood on the two doorposts and lintel, to the cooking, to the eating, to the disposing of the lamb, that is all part of Yahuwah's Passover. Every step is contained in the Passover observance. The command is to select the Pesach on day 10, and you keep it until day 14. In Hebrew, we read the particle ad, which means as far as or until. So you keep it until you reach day 14, which would mean the sundown following the end of day 13. Since the day begins in the evening, you would keep the Pesach until sunset and proceed with the rest of the Passover ordinances at the beginning of day 14. You kill it at twilight, which is the time between sunset and complete darkness, also known as between the evenings. After it is killed, during this brief period of light, you take the blood and place it on the entrance of your house. You would then proceed to cook the Pesach. After it is cooked, it is then eaten. Notice that it needed to be eaten that night. What night? Clearly the, the night portion of day 14 after it was killed at twilight. You also needed to dispose of it before morning. What morning? Obviously the morning portion of day 14. Again, if you understand a Hebrew day, then these requirements will all make sense. While the selection of HaPesach occurs on day 10, all of the remaining aspects of HaPesach occur between the two demarcation points in a day, evening and morning. In this case, the evening and following morning of day 14. The ordinances of the Passover that must occur on day 14 involve, one, killing the sacrifice, two, spreading the blood on the doorpost and lentil with hyssop, cooking it roasted with fire and herbs, eating it with certain ingredients, I guess is where the herbs are, including the unleavened bread and bitter herbs, and then five, disposing of it before sunrise on, the same, on that same day. Again, these are all the ordinances of Yahuwah's Passover. All of the Passover has to occur on day 14, and we know that a day begins after sunset. The Passover in Egypt was a very somber event and involved darkness and death outside, with people inside their homes protected and covered by the blood of the Lamb. When the work of the lamb was finished and all the traces of the Pesach were burned with fire before morning, the people then came out of the darkness and into the light of the day. That is when they would begin to assemble for their deliverance. Only after the Pesach was complete, it was all very straightforward with incredible prophetic significance. So after day 13 ends, at the setting of the sun, day 14 begins, as does every day with a time known as between the evenings, being ha arbium. It is, it is the period often referred to as twilight between sunset and complete darkness. That is when you would slaughter the lamb at the beginning of day 14. That is the only way we can keep all the ordinances of the Passover on day 14. It is without question that the two daily sacrifices in the temple occurred at sunrise and sun at sunset. These are the two demarcation points built into creation from the very beginning of time. 
Traditions changed the evening sacrifice to a time earlier in the day, and these changes and distortions were the part of the reason why Yahuwah simply allowed the temple to be destroyed. It is prohibited to, to alter his instructions, and there is a price to pay when you do. The priests were taking shortcuts and doing sloppy work. Here's an account from 2 Maccabees in the King James Version. Now such was the height of Greek fashions and increase of the heathenish manners through the exceeding profaneness of Jason, that ungodly wretch and no high priest, that the priests had no courage to serve any more at the altar, but despising the temple and neglecting the sacrifices, hastened to be partakers of the unlawful allowance in the place of exercise after the game of discus called them forth, not setting by the honors of their fathers, but likely the glory of the Grecians best of all. By reason there whereof sore calamity came upon them, for they had them to be their enemies and avengers, whose custom they have followed so earnestly, and unto whom they desired to be like in all things. For it is not a light to do wickedly against the laws of God, but the time following shall declare these things. Second Maccabees four, eleven through seventeen. While these there were reforms after the Maccabean revolt, things deteriorated again prior to Yahushua's arrival. The people were divided and the temple was profaned. The priests consisted of an arist, arist, I don't even know what that word is, aristocracy. I don't even know what that word is. I sound ignorant. Uh, aristocracy, influenced by their Roman overlords. That is why Yahushua repeatedly cleansed the temple when he went to Jerusalem. He didn't do it just once. As a result, we do not base our Torah observance upon the historical practices of a corrupted priesthood. Let me be very clear. There is no 3 o'clock p.m. sacrifice in a properly functioning temple. The term between the evenings in the Torah does not refer to the time when the sun is at its highest to when it finally sets. We are talking a span of hours. No, there, are, there were the two Olad Tamid sacrifices that occurred at sunrise, the dawning of the day and the sunset, and at sunset, twilight. They were made at the door of the temple, Exodus 29, 38 through 42. These are very important times in creation. The separation between light and dark and the connection with the Pesach cannot be ignored. The Passover sacrifice occurred at the same time as evening, Ola Tamad, twilight. As a result, there's only one twilight period in any given day, and it occurs at the very beginning of the day. It is highly significant for the calendar because this is the period when we sight the new moon after sunset. Twilight is a brief transition period between light and dark and is a time of renewal when we witness a renewal of a day, a month, and even a year. This understanding is completely consistent with Hebrew thought and the Hebrew scriptures. Now, when people do not understand this information they, and look at a poor translation of Deuteronomy 16.6, their confusion usually escalates. Take, for instance, this common translation. You may not sacrifice the Passover within any of your gates, which the Lord your God gives you. But at the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide, there you shall sacrifice the Passover at twilight at the going down of the sun at the time you came out of Egypt. The English in verse 6 might lead one to believe that he was referring to the end of day 14, but the Hebrew does not reflect that. First of all, the Hebrew for twilight or between the evenings, ben ha Ibrim, is not contained in this passage, only evening, Ereb. Also, the English translation, sun going down, is misleading. The Hebrew simply refers to sunset. Finally, the time they came out of Egypt is referring to the Moad, and we know that the Moad that they slaughtered the Pesach was Passover on day 14. So Deuteronomy 16.6 literally reads, There you shall sacrifice the Passover in the evening at sunset at the appointed time when you were brought out of Egypt. This text changes nothing regarding the Passover, and when translated accurately, it simply confirms and clarifies that between the evenings means the time to sacrifice the Pesach is at sunset at the beginning of day 14. Once you slaughter your lamb during twilight, you would then need to prepare the lamb and cook the lamb in fire. This process would take hours, and you are well past the evening and into the night by then. You eat in darkness, and many people stay up all night as, Yah as did Yahushua. Passover is a watch night while we wait and stay ready to leave if Yahuwah decides to deliver us. Here is a highly significant point. The culmination of the Passover event occurs at midnight. This is, that is when you definitely had to be in your house and covered by the blood. Midnight was when Yahuwah said he would go out in the midst of Egypt and strike the firstborn. Exodus 11, 4 and 12, 29. If you celebrate Passover at the end of day 14, then you would not be covered by the blood at midnight on day 14. If you are a, first, if you are a firstborn, you're dead. Another significant point is that you need to finish the Passover before sunrise, Exodus 34, 25. Again, this is still day 14. In, e day 14. in Egypt, 
the Israelites remained protected in the night while the firstborn of Egypt were being killed. The Passover observance does not involve the killing of the sacrifice. It involves everything having to do with that special sacrifice. Most of the significant aspects of the Passover observance occur in the dark. And the only way to accomplish this is on day 14, as the Torah prescribes, is if the slaughtering occurs after sunset, the completion of day 13 and the beginning of day 14, and everything else occurs before sunrise. That is the only correct way to observe the Passover, period. That is how Moshe instructed the Israelites to do it. That's how Joshua did it in Israel, crossed the Jordan, after Israel crossed the Jordan, and that's how Yahushua did it. We will examine that in more detail further on. If the Israelites decided to follow the Pharisaic method and observe the Passover during the night portion of day 15, all their firstborn would have been dead. Thankfully, they followed Moshe. This is not too difficult, and it only gets confusing when you start inserting your own preconceived notions or the false teachings or traditions of others. It is helpful to remember that the Yishrites didn't have cell phones or mass transportation. The entire process involved time as Moshe and Aaron appear before Moshe, uh, excuse me, appear before Pharaoh in the night of Passover and were told to leave Egypt. They didn't send out a text to everyone to start leaving at that moment. They needed to return to the Yishrites in Goshen, who were in their homes, covered by the blood throughout the night and completing the Passover ordinances before sunrise. They weren't headed out of Egypt that night. When the Yisraelites exited the protection of their homes on the morning of day 14, after completing all the ordinances, they needed to get their mules and carts loaded and then assembled. Imagine if you were packing up your belongings, including all of the wealth plundered from the Egyptians, it would be quite a process. Then they had to travel from their individual homes in Goshen to Ramses, where they gathered and mustered into divisions like an army. That all happened throughout light portion of day 14 and after sunset into day 15. When they finally began their exodus on the first day of unleavened bread, day 15 of month one. That is when their journey began and that is why it is specifically associated with unleavened bread because they were traveling during the entire seven day feast. The idea that this all occurred on day 15, including a Passover observance, is simply preposterous and untenable. The Torah specifically tells us that the Israelites left Egypt on the day after the Passover. They departed from Ramses in the first month on the 15th day of the first month. On the day after the Passover, the children of Yisrael went out with boldness in the sight of all the Egyptians. Numbers 33. 3. Again, Passover is the full day of day 14 and really must be in order to follow all of the ordinances of the Passover on that day. Nowhere does it ever state to observe any portion of the Passover on day 15. To believe such a thing involves completely disregarding all of the commandments that point to day 14. The Passover and the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread are two separate and distinct moedim, memorizing, memorizing, memorializing two separate and distinct events. Thank you, Nicole. I appreciate you. The Passover was by no means a feast, and anybody who thinks the somber process of the Passover is a feast is entirely missing the point of the rehearsal. The Passover lamb was probably the most perfect and adorable little lamb that you had ever seen. It lived with your family for four days. No doubt the children got attached to it and treated it like an adored pet. The command was to keep it, which means to guard and to watch over it. You had to make sure that nothing happened to it. It needed to remain unblemished. After all, that attention, you then had to kill it. Cook it with his entrail and eat it in haste. You didn't eat in comfort. You were standing with your traveling attire on to remind you that this was all being done so that you could leave your bondage. The accompanying items on the menu were bitter and bland. This was not a feast. This was Yahuwah's Passover. The feast would come later, after the Passover, when the work of the Passover was completed. In fact, the feast would begin the following day after sunset on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So if you are making your Passover into a feast, you are not following the Torah and you are entirely missing the point. The Passover is not a fun, festive event. It is a simple, somber, quick meal. It's not meant to be a party. We are also supposed to teach how serious this is to our children. If we present it like a party, then we are failing in our mandate and we are misleading them. Further, the Passover was not about a temple sacrifice or the altar at the temple as some messianic teachers promote. The atonement at the temple occurred on Yom Kippur. While it was mandated to make the sacrifice at the place where Yahuwah placed his name, Passover is about individual houses and families, Deuteronomy 16, 5, and 6. My dogs are probably going to bark. I'm super sorry. Remember that when Yisrael was in Egypt, there was no Levitic priesthood prior to Mount Sinai. The most ancient line of priesthood is the Melchizedek line, where the firstborn is the priest of the family. So it was the firstborn who entered into the blood covenant as priests for the families. That's a great thing on Melchizedek. The focus of the Passover is on the Melchizedek and their house. That is why it was the firstborn that were saved. That is the focus of the Passover, the firstborn priests. 
Rabbinitic Judaism lost that focus and merged the Passover with the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That is a historical fact and a clear error, as we can plainly see through their own writings. They changed the Torah, and that resulted in people celebrating the Passover on day 15 instead of observing it on day 14. Remember that the Passover is about a sacrifice that turns into a meal, and the body and blood of that sacrifice are the focus. It is not just the timing of the death of the sacrifice. It is also the blood on the doorpost and lentil, the preparation of the Pesach, the meal, and the completion before sunrise. They all must occur on day 14th of month 1. You don't kill a Passover at the end of day 14 and then slide the rest of the Passover into day 15. By doing so, you are mixing and violating clear commandments to keep the Passover on day 14. It's really that simple. But people get distracted because they want the scriptures to conform to their desired paradigm or some preconceived notion. I see people fixated on the timing of the crucifixion and ready to throw out a significant portion of the New Testament in order to make their paradigm work. They want Yahushua to have died at the same time that lambs were being slaughtered. But in order to do this, they must ignore the specific commandments in the Torah and the explicit words and actions of Yahushua involving the Last Supper, which was clearly a Passover observance. They also must ignore the culmination of the prophets and prophecies involving the long-awaited renewal of the covenant with Yisrael, all so they can get the timing of his death to fit their paradigm. This process is entirely backwards, but what about the lamb for Yahuwah at Yom Kippur? What does, Yah does Yahushua have to be slaughtered on day 10 of month 7? How about the other sin offerings? Does Yahushua's death have to coincide with those as well? Some people are missing the point. These were patterns and symbols. For goodness sakes, Yahushua was crucified on a stake by the Romans outside the gates. Is that how Passover lambs are supposed to be slaughtered? Of course not. This fixation on how and when Yahushua died is a complete distraction. The focus should be on the first fact that the Melchizedek high priest, the firstborn son, appeared as the Lamb of Elohim to perform his priestly function at a Passover meal with 12 disciples, representing all Yisrael. The Passover is a process through which the covenant is established and reaffirmed at the appointed time on day 14. That is why circumcision is a requirement for participation. It is the entry point for those in covenant. A stranger is commanded to obey all of the rites, kukat, kukat, and all the ceremony, mishpat, Numbers 9.14. At that important Passover meal where the covenant was received, Yahushua revealed that the bread and the wine represented his body and his blood would, that would soon be shed to seal that renewed covenant, the renewed covenant. He didn't renew the covenant on day 13th of month one, the day before the Passover. Why would he do that? He renewed the covenant at Yahuwah's Passover at night on day 14. He later died on Passover day. That was the fulfillment of day 14 rehearsal. Very interestingly, that was the light bulb that went off for me when I began my Torah walk over 20 years ago. When I realized that the last, that, that the so-called last supper was actually the appointed time of Passover, I began to re-examine everything. I learned in Christianity that separated Yahushua from all things Jewish. Sadly, almost immediately after beginning my covenant journey, I was met with a contrary teaching that promoted the fact that Yahushua actually did not renew the covenant at Passover. I later discovered that the teacher had an alternative motive to have Yahushua die at the moment that the high priest slaughtered a lamb in the temple. It was all about the drama, and it ignored truth. Those who promoted that teaching completely missed the point that the Pesach is not a temple sacrifice performed by high priest, but the drama was too hard to resist. So in order to make it work, they had to completely disregard the emphasis placed upon the Passover ordinances in the scriptures and the clear statements of Yahushua himself and tried to prove that the Last Supper was not a Passover meal. What a tragedy. But that plays into our society and culture. Some people would rather be entertained than follow truth. Many prefer excitement and drama over simple Torah instruction. As a result, some teachers get famous for their dramatic teachings, even though they get it wrong. Remember all the drama concerning the blood moons? I warned in my book titled The, First, the Final Shofar that these were not the signs they claimed to be. Again, the motivation of some teachers is to entertain. To have Yahushua die when the lambs were being slaughtered for Passover is definitely dramatic. It then becomes a mental block for some people because it sounds so perfect. Once they get that in their mind, they will do ac acrobatics with the scriptures to maintain their paradigm. I see this happen all the time. When a person has an agenda, they can wrestle the scriptures to say just about anything they want. I guarantee you that despite all the evidence I have presented so far, there will still be some people who will desperately search for some rogue passage that they will latch on to so they can ignore all the other passages. This selective interpretation is called esogis. <laughs> I don't even know what that word is. And some people have turned it into an art form. Esogesis. 
involves making a text say what you want it to say. Usually the Esogete already has certain beliefs and is simply looking for through the Bible to find passages that will support that belief. The Esogete will ignore any passages that would dispute his or her belief and is simply looking for to proof text the position that he or she already desires to advocate. If there are any passages that seem to dispute their preconceived ideology, they simply seek to reinterpret them or apply a different hermeneutic to it. And again, that's the same thing we were talking about earlier when Fear Monger was talking to the Christian people and they, they just ignore you, right? It, it, they, <laughs> so many times you'll tell people that you cannot eat unclean foods and the first thing they quote you is messiah made all food clean then they go and they they talk about peter and the, the animals coming down and how he's reiterated twice that don't let anything dirty be they don't let him say anything is clean be made dirty and so they're like oh man swine is clean but you can't do stuff like that this is a technique um did i read this one okay sadly this is impossible for some people remember the sadducees and the pharisees have the living torah appear before them and they rejected him in preference for their customs and traditions, their nasty oral Torah. Are you following the Torah of Elohim or your own oral Torah? Are you ignoring the plan, the plain instructions in the scriptures because of your own ideas, traditions, or pre preferred observances? Of course, that is what Christianity does all the time concerning the Torah. And those coming out of Christianity must be careful to not continue in that dangerous practice. I know Christians who are expert Isigets, Isigets, in using passages from the writings of Paul to prove that Christians do not need to follow the commandments. So I provided a brief summary on the issue of Passover and the timing of my observance. I el elaborate much deeper in my book, Appointed Times. I also lay out the timeline for Yahushua's observance of the Passover in the book titled The Messiah. But you don't have to read my books to find this information. In fact, rather than reinvent the wheel, here with all the, all the research and documentation, uh, I would refer you to a very comprehensive article titled The Passover Resurrection, Observing Passover 2020 Vision. It is a free download on the Torah Calendar website, and I suggest that you thoroughly review this as it clearly and unequivocally state, shows the proper observance of the Passover. The false teaching that Yahushua did not observe a Passover is addressed in another comprehensive article titled Do This in Remembrance of Me. The evidence is irrefutable, and it's all there for you to read if you want the truth and you want to walk in the truth. From my experience, most who have already made up their minds will not. We live in a society that wants the wide and easy way. They would rather watch a brief snazzy YouTube video than read a book. Most people have extremely short extension spans. They don't want to spend the time researching. They won't even stick around as I'm reading this. <laughs> That's how low it is these days. They want quick answers and immediate solutions. That reflects the drive through mentality so steeped into Western culture. The Torah commands diligence, and that often requires significant time and great effort to dig for the truth. Nevertheless, the rewards are incredible. Once you find those precious gems, it then requires obedience to walk in the truth. Sometimes that involves the courage, strength, and humility to admit you are wrong. Change your ways and modify your plans. Believe me, I know. For the past 20 years, I have gotten on a plane and traveled in the land of Yisrael two and three times a year, literally rehearsing these appointed times. As I walked them out in light of the Torah, I was able to discern false teachings and traditions that I had inherited along the way. I had to make adjustments and change my plans, sometimes at great expense and inconvenience. What I found though, my journey, what I have found through my journey is that some people simply like their traditions and they don't want to change. Some people just want it to be fun and games, all fun and games. They don't want Passover to be a somber event. They want to have a big party. Still others are stubborn and because of pride, refuse to alter their plans. They are set in their ways. The walk is daily, is a daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly test for us all. We are constantly making choices that need to determine whether we will submit our minds, or our will, our entire beings to him. What do, what do we desire and what will we pray for? Is it our will or is it his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven? Prior to King David, the children of Israel were in a state of division and confusion as the text of Judges concludes. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes, Judges 21, 25. As we await the return of King Yahushua, we see the same thing happening. I see people who claim to celebrate the feast, but they have never truly watched over, protected, and rehearsed the appointed times. They're willing to party, but they don't want anything to be inconvenient or uncomfortable. I also see... Some of these people teaching others and sending people into error. As a result, many people get distracted, stray away from the path and stumble. Just because Yahushua had not yet returned doesn't mean, has not yet returned, does not mean that we cannot find the truth. It simply means that some people are unwilling to submit to the truth. They are headstrong and belligerent. That is what Yahushua will be returning. That is, 
I think he says, that is why Yahushua will be returning with a sharp sword and a rod. Revelation 19.15. And yes, he's coming back to destroy. The rod of iron is for those who disobey him. Psalm 2.9, Revelation 2.27. I would rather avoid that rod and get things straight before he returns. One thing I am not afraid of is feeling that rod for following the Torah. It, I'm not afraid of is feeling that rod for following the Torah and keeping all of the ordinances of the Passover on day 14 exactly as the Torah prescribes. As the Passover approaches, I plan on honoring my king through acknowledging him as the Passover lamb of Elohim. I will keep watch over the Passover and remember his somber and incredible observance when he revealed that he would be the lamb and renewed the covenant through his broken body and shed blood. I will later keep watch as he kept watch until it was it was time for him to die. Those who continue to defy his clear instructions do it do it their own way and observe Passover on day 15 should expect correction. Excuse me. This is really a big deal, folks. We are instructed to diligently obey the instructions and do what is right and good in the sight of Yahuwah. Deuteronomy 6, 17, 19. When we do this, he watches over us and blesses us. I can assure you that there is only one way to observe the Passover. Yahuwah is not double-minded and does not want us being double-minded. James describes the double-minded as unstable in all his ways, James 1.8. In fact, being double-minded is in direct opposition to the Torah. I hate the double-minded, but I love your Torah, Psalms 119.113. So don't kid yourself if you think you are actually observing the Passover at the end of day 14. You are not. You are observing most, if not all, of the ordinances of the Passover on day 15, and you are violating the Torah. This is not just a matter of, oh, well, you do it on the 14th and we do it on the 15th and that's okay. It is not okay with Yahuwah. That attitude has the Christian doctrine of grace all over it. It is lukewarm and exposes the root of Christianity that is still embedded deep within people. Yahuwah is not schizophrenic. He only has one way and it's not cool to celebrate or condone diversity when dealing with his appointed times. He is not pleased with division within his assembly. He is all about law and order. And so much of the division that exists stems from the people still carrying Christian baggage. Speaking of Christianity, we can actually trace this entire issue back to Rome and what has been called the Corto Decimen controversy. The word Corto Decimen simply means 14th. You see the early followers of Yahushua obviously continued to observe Passover after his death and resurrection, and they kept it at the beginning of day 14. This is a historical fact attested to by historians, including Ephesinius around 380 CE against heresies, section 70. It was the assembly in Rome that sought to change the time of what was referred to as the Savior's Passover. Eusebius, Church History, Book 5, 23, 1. I have no idea what that even is. The assemblies under John's oversight in Asia Minor resisted the change. They were the same assemblies described in the text of Revelation, by the way. They were faithful to preserve the specific time taught to them by John, the disciples of Yahushua, who is described as follows. Now there were they there were leaning on Yahushua's bosom one of his disciples whom Yahushua loved. John 13, 23. So you don't have to take my word for it. You have John and his disciples, and John got it straight from Yahushua. Is that enough to convince you? Who is better to have as a witness to the specific issue? Is it any wonder that Yahushua specifically spoke to those faithful assemblies in the text of Revelation who properly watched over the Passover? Polycarp, a direct disciple of John, actually went to Rome to address the issue with Ante Antisetus, the bishop of Rome. Antisetus refused to relent and continued to promote the change. Later, around 190 CE, Polycrates, who was the disciple of Polycarp, went to Rome and met with Victor, the bishop of Rome, concerning the timing of the Passover. Here's what Polycrates set forth in writing in support of day 14th of observance. Sorry, this is long, guys. Todd is an attorney, and he is extremely detailed. Bear with me. We're almost done. We observe the exact day, neither adding or taking away, for in Asia also great lights have fallen asleep which shall rise again on the day of the master's coming when he shall come in glory with glory from heaven and shall seek out all the set apart ones. Among these are Philip, one of the 12 apostles, and moreover John, who was both a witness and a teacher, who reclined upon the bosom of the master, and Polycarp and Smyrna, who was a bishop and martyr, others are mentioned, Melito, the eunuch, who lived all together in the set apart spirit and who lies in Sardis, awaiting the epicope from heaven. All of these observed the 14th day of the Passover according to the gospel, deviating in no respect, but following the rule of faith. Am I close to being done on this, Nicole? Um, we're about a quarter left. A quarter left, okay. Um, I'm going to take a quick sip. The response from Rome of coffee. The response from Rome was what you might expect. Excommunication. The rest is history. 
This issue created an enormous rift in the body of Messiah, and we can actually follow the continuing division and separation through the Council of Nicaea in 325 CE, as well as the Council of Laodicea in 364. And a side note, the, those guys are not good. The Council of Nicaea is terrible. That's why we have it's, it's all Catholicism. Incredibly, moving Passover from day 14 and the event that largely resulted in Rome deviating from the Torah and establishing the Roman Catholic Church, it can also be seen in the division between the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Western Roman Church. It is simply astonishing that we are still feeling the effects on this, of this issue and that it is still causing division. Of course, that is all part of leaving Babylon and coming out of a man-made religion. Passover is a favorite point of division and the forces of Rome that are tugging at people are strong. This is because Passover is the entry to the covenant path, just like the Sabbath is a sign of that covenant. These two witnesses are the, are the two rails on the covenant journey. They are critical to the covenant journey, just like the witnesses of the two great lights in the heavens that mark time, so we can properly observe the appointed times. The enemy wants to derail you and divide you. Changing these two important times is critical for the Roman deception to succeed. The enemy needs to get people out of sync with the appointed times because he knows that is how Yahuwah will redeem and gather his people. It is crystal clear that Yahushua observed the Passover at the beginning of day 14 and he taught his disciples to do so. His disciple continued that observance until Rome stepped in just like the rabbis did in the Pharisaic religion of Judaism. The religions of men are all about distracting people from the truth. So if you follow the Pope or the Pharisees or even the Karaites, go ahead and observe their holiday on day 15 on their calendar. And again, Make no mistake about it, if you think you are observing the Passover at the end of day 14, you are not. You are really observing most, if not all, of the ordinances of the Passover on day 15, you have been deceived. I choose to follow Yahushua because I recognize him as the Passover, Hapasak, and I want to eat with him. Remember that the next time Yahushua hosts a meal, it will be a feast, the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is the same Lamb who hosted the Passover meal referred to as the Last Supper on day 14 of month 1. He renewed the covenant at that Passover and only those who follow the narrow way and diligently keep his commandments will join him at the future feast. But wait, you might say, how can you be so dogmatic? It's just the difference of a day after all, right? Well, tell that to the firstborn in Egypt. If they were a day late, they would have all been dead. It is a critical and significant distinction that those who follow Messiah must understand. It is a matter of the heart and a matter of obedience to the Torah. Our observance either brings honor to him or dishonor. My desire is for the people to understand and follow the great shepherd, not some false prophet or teacher with a YouTube channel or a website who has no idea what it really means to follow the Torah and rehearse the appointed times. There are plenty of those to go around and they are deceiving many who are ready to believe their lies. I want us all to be at the wedding feast, but sadly we know that many will not make it in. They will arrive too late and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth as they regret the decisions that they made. Remember that the parable of the, the ten virgins was all about timing. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet their bridegroom. Meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose, trimmed their lamps, and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, Say, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you. But go rather to those who buy, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Matthew 25, 1 through 13. These were all virgins who wanted to go to the wedding feast. They all had lamps, but five of them didn't have oil. Currently, we have a lot of people carrying the lamps, i.e. scriptures, but they aren't following the commandments. They don't have any oil. Did you notice the emphasis on midnight? That is the same time emphasized at the Passover, Exodus 11, 4 and Exodus 12, 29. The message couldn't be any clearer. We read in the Proverbs, for the commandment is a lamp and in the Torah is a light, Proverbs 6, 23. The commandments are written instructions that are not just words on a page. They are supposed to be written on our hearts. The reason for that is because the heart pumps blood through our bodies and keeps us alive. The words are our life. And when we live them, we emit light into the world. If you have the scriptures, but don't obey them, you will be in darkness. 
You can't carry your scriptures, read them, even highlight every page. But if you, you uh, it says you can, you can carry your scriptures, read them, even highlight every page. But if you don't diligently walk the path, you are classified as foolish. It is no coincidence there are five specific ordinances involving the Pesach that need to occur on day 14. Notice that the odds aren't so great. Only 50% of the, the ones attend, intending to get into the wedding feast will make it in. And even some who get in will be thrown out. See Matthew 22, 2 and 13. Yahushua will warn that the way to life is narrow and difficult and few will find it. Matthew 7, 14. He also warned that he would be rejecting many people who thought they were doing the will of the Father, but they really were not. Matthew 7, 21, 23. This isn't a game, and many people are going to be deceived and miss out. This is not Todd Bennett just spouting off. Those are the clear and unequivocal words of the Messiah. The bottom line is that the foolish virgins were not ready. They will regret that they fell asleep, they were unprepared, and they missed the appointed time. They showed up too late, which is the same scenario for those who observe Passover one day late. The enemy has laid a trap for those who are not diligently keeping and rehearsing the commandments. And I believe it reveals whether or not the words are written on our hearts. Will you be observing and remembering the Passover through a sober observance on day 14? Or will you be waiting to turn the Passover into a feast on day 15? The answer to that question might determine whether you are among the foolish or the wise. Be certain to make the right choice. Next week, I hope to send a message out early. On preparation day, since the Passover begins Friday after sundown and the Feast of Unleavened Bread begins on Saturday after sundown. Baraka, Todd. And there's this site, um, ShemaiYisrael.net. And there's also a thing here. Um, I prepared a chart on the upcoming appointed times you can download from the website, ShemaiYisrael.net. And make sure it's S-H-E-M-A-Y-I-S-R-A-E-L.net. Um, and it's a great resource. So guys, I hope this does this for you. This was an extremely long reading. Um, I guess my eyesight is doing well, and I hope, uh, this is the first time I read it through, so please excuse my uh, obviously ignorant grammatical mistakes on this stuff. And I hope this helps you guys. I hope this helps you guys find the right path and get you guys on the right path. And I did read a lot. Wow, that was a lot of reading there. I'm still trying to get to the top of this. Okay, guys, for everybody who made it through to the end, I know there's not a lot of you. But for you who did it, much love to you. And I hope you guys are keeping the shot. I'll never make it to the top. I guess I made it to the top. There we go. Okay. Much love, everybody. I'm out.